Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So I have a quick question, a question for dog owners here at Epiphany. We have some dog owners out there, okay? What happens when you try to point something out to your dog? Maybe a squirrel in the backyard or their, their favorite toy on the other side of the living room. Well, most dogs look at your finger, right? Kind of stare at it, go, that's a very nice finger you have there. In fact, if they were like my favorite family dog of long ago and far away, a wonderful golden retriever named Ginger, they stare intently at your finger while the squirrel ambles away with its mouth full of nuts in the other direction, no doubt saying a grateful prayer to God for making dogs unable to get the point of a point. You probably heard the old saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. I'm convinced there are all also no atheist squirrels when dogs are around. Now that said, I'm afraid that sometimes we can be kind of like my beloved dog, Ginger, when we are thinking about the events around Jesus' birth. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, to quote our rector emeritus here at Epiphany, Father Robin Rao, I am glad you asked. <laughs> what I mean by that is we can be caught up in the details of the first Christmas to such an extent that we don't quite take in its bigger meaning, its point. And this is just as true for preachers as it is for everyone else. There are, I am sure, many sermons being preached right now that offer a plausible astronomical theory, for instance, for the Star of Bethlehem. And others are probably pounding the pulpit, telling their congregations that, that the manger was really a lower room of a standard Middle Eastern house, not a stable out in a field like it is in all the Christmas cards. I know this because I have covered both of these points myself in some detail in past Christmas Eve sermons. I even remember explaining the precise alignments of several planets over Judea in 7 or 6 BC in one of those sermons. Now, of course, these sorts of sermons aren't all bad. Thinking through historical details is sometimes what we need to do in order to trust what the Bible says as true. But this year, I'm not going to do that. This year, I am going to get to the point. And the point of Christmas isn't actually the star or the manger or the location of the stable or whether or not the inn was actually an inn. All these things point somewhere else. They point to Jesus, the son of Mary, born in Bethlehem. So who is this Jesus that these things point to? Let's look at our Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 9 together this Christmas evening. It's page 573 in the blue Bibles in the seat backs in front of you if you'd like to follow along. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 7. Now Isaiah chapter 9 was written about 700 years before Jesus was born, give or take. And actually we know exactly when Isaiah 9 was written. He did, what he describes is very easy to place. The year is 700 B.C. The problem's on the other end. We don't know exactly what year Jesus was born. Even so, even though it's more than 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah 9 tells us pretty th much everything we need to know about the Messiah. That's the point of these verses we heard in Isaiah chapter 9, our first reading this evening. They tell us who is coming to bring redemption to God's people. And they also tell us what that Redeemer will look like. Now, the first thing Isaiah tells us is that this coming Messiah, this coming Redeemer, will be given by God to his people, not earned by his people. And we see this in verse 2 where it says, the people who walked in darkness, who lived in darkness, have seen a great light. They've not kindled a great light. They have not found a great light. No, they've seen it. It's been given to them. And verse 3 re reinforces this picture. 
The Messiah's coming, it says, is, is like joy at a harvest. Every farmer and even every backyard gardener knows that you can till and weed and tend as much as you want. But it's actually God who gives the growth through, through the weather, through the rain, through all these things that also come into play. And even more strongly, in verses 4 and 5, the Messiah is coming, Isaiah says, is like a victory in battle over an evil overlord. He says, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor, you have broken. And the you here is God, not God's people. They celebrate this victory and they claim the spoils, but God did the fighting for them. So first, Isaiah tells us that the coming Messiah, the Redeemer, is given, given by God to his people, not earned. And we might have expected that because the God of the Bible, he gives he gives Adam and Eve clothing to cover their shame. He gives Noah a rainbow promise that he will never flood the earth again. He gives Jacob and Sarah a son named Isaac in their old age. He gives those descendants of Jacob and Sarah an escape from slavery in Egypt by parting the Red Sea. He gives Israel a king and the shepherd boy David coming Messiah in Isaiah chapter 9 joins this long list. He is given by God to his people. Now, the second thing Isaiah's prophecy here in chapter 9 tells us about the coming Messiah is more surprising. Look at verse 6. He says, for us, for to us, a child is born. A child. The Messiah will be a child? I mean, this is strange. How can a child bring about the kind of victory that Isaiah has just prophesied? How can a child break yokes for bearing heavy loads and snap staffs for striking bloody backs? Even more strange, what child can himself bear the burden of ruling God's people, carrying their government upon his shoulder on the throne of David and over his kingdom, as Isaiah says in verse 7? of chapter 9. And strangest of all, what child could ever be born with, with these titles in chapter 6? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I don't know about you, but these are not names I call my children. <laughs> the picture of the Messiah here in Isaiah chapter 9 is, is of a very special <laughs> child. On one hand, children and babies are weak and vulnerable. But this child comes and combines that weakness with great power and the greatest of all names, mighty God. So the coming Messiah is a gift from God. He's not earned. And the Messiah is a child, but a child born a victor and a counselor, prince of peace, mighty God. And finally... Isaiah 9 says one more thing. He says the Messiah is a son. To us, a son is given. Well, we might say, of course he is. Male children tend to be someone's son. But here's the rub. Remember, Isaiah has already named him Mighty God, an everlasting father. How can God be a son? How can the everlasting father be a son? At the time of Isaiah, no one knew. For hundreds and hundreds of years that followed, this is what is called an orphaned prophecy, a prophecy that people couldn't figure out. All the way down through the centuries to the time of Mary and Joseph. This strange prophecy of Isaiah's about the coming Messiah remained unfulfilled. But then, but then, when, as our gospel passage from Luke chapter 2 says, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Then the gift was given. The child was born. The only son who is properly called mighty God and everlasting father came in to the world. And his name is Jesus, born of Mary in the city of David, Bethlehem. 
This, this Jesus, is where Isaiah chapter 9 points and has always pointed. And this is where Christmas points. We are called to come near and see Jesus, our Messiah. But my question for all of us this Christmas Eve is this. Do we see Jesus? Can we see Jesus in our Christmas this year? Well, you're here on Christmas Eve. That's a good beginning. But there is so much else that, that competes for our attention at this time of year. Everything from figuring out which recipes to use for our Christmas meal tomorrow to getting ready to do our taxes in January. There is so much that it can be easy to lose sight of our Messiah, our Savior, in the middle of it all. So this is what I suggest. Make a point. Make a point to make space for the story of the Messiah this Christmas. Wake up tomorrow morning, get your coffee, maybe put a little eggnog in it. That's very good. <laughs> but before you dive into the events of the day, pick up your Bible and turn to the Ch Gospel of Luke and, and read chapters 1 and 2. If you have friends or family with you and they're willing, read these chapters together, aloud. In these two chapters, there is so much richness to reflect on. There's John the Baptist and Mary's visit from the angel Gabriel and her magnificent song. And there's Zachariah's prophecy and Jesus' birth in Bethlehem and the angel's glorious chorus. And there's the wandering, wandering shepherds. It'll take a little time, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, but for most of us, this is time we have, particularly on Christmas Day. Friends, Jesus is the point, and the only point of Christmas and everything that surrounds it. He is the gift of God. He is the child and the son. He is our wonderful counselor and mighty God and everlasting father and prince of peace. My prayer for all of us this Christmas Eve is that we look to him with awe and wonder. And leave it to our dogs, as lovable as they are, to get distracted by a finger. Amen.